You know, I recently got a day job at an independent video game store, and if it has reaffirmed anything in my mind, it's that video games are freaking expensive. That's not exactly a groundbreaking revelation, but as I process trades and get intimately familiar with their inventory, I've continually found myself in sticker shock. Did you know that the original Chibi Robo has nearly tripled in price since 2019 and now fetches over $200 for a complete copy? Did you know that's also like one-sixth of the value of the most expensive release on the system? There are plenty of interesting stories to be told about the value of games for various systems, but one library I found myself drawn to is the PlayStation 3, primarily because PS3 prices are pretty much as low as they're ever going to be. Most games on the system can be had for less than $10, and most of the must-have titles are still far less expensive than those on, say, the GameCube. Before we get too far into the video though, I need to pay my rent, so allow me to welcome back the channel's first ever sponsor, Opera GX, who have been so kind as to support the show once again. Opera GX is the world's first web browser built for gamers, and like I said last time, that's much more than a gimmicky tagline. I've been a Chrome user for over a decade, and on top of the RAM management issues that everyone's familiar with, I actually ran into an issue not long after the last Opera sponsorship where YouTube videos wouldn't even load in Google's own browser. Not only do those same videos work just fine in Opera GX, I was also able to enjoy picture-in-picture -picture playback, automatic media pausing when opening videos, and more. Opera GX has you covered for both form and function, theming, free VPNs, native support for Google Chrome extensions, and integrations for all your favorite social media, chat clients, and music apps. All for free, straight out of the box. Switching is easier than ever with Opera's quick import tool, and now you can even get Opera GX on your phone with the new GX Mobile Beta, ready for anyone to download and use, absolutely free. If you like my content, and if you enjoy a good web browser, give Opera GX a shot today from the link in the description. I learned from the comments last time that quite a few of you are already fans of the browser, and by using my link to download Opera GX, you're directly contributing to the future of this channel. So once again, a big thanks to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. The affordability of the PS3's library makes it a great system to collect for, but it also makes the rare instance of a high price tag far more interesting. Take Africa, for example, a 2009 release by Natsume. If you want a complete in-box copy today, it'll run you in the neighborhood of $200. Why so expensive? Well, unsurprisingly, with a title like Africa, and cover art like this, it didn't exactly sell gangbusters. The branding does positively nothing to communicate Africa's premise. Am I hunting zebras? Raising them? Is it a Zoo Tycoon clone? Take a long look at this box art and attempt to guess what kind of game it is, or really anything about it other than the fact that it's set in the African plains. If you guessed Pokemon Snap clone, you've either played this before, or you've got an impressive knack for clairvoyance and should go buy a lottery ticket. It's literally Pokemon Snap without the Pokemon. So, just Snap, then. Africa was an interesting little game. You could buy officially licensed Sony camera gear, and put it to use to taking pictures of African wildlife. While that concept may not have much mass appeal, I think the poor sales can mostly be attributed to obtuse branding and attachment to a publisher with relatively small footprint in the American market. I mean, it's sold way better in Japan, where Natsume is a much better known and respected name with much more marketing presence. For reference, Japanese copies only run around $15. In America, though, the low sales meant relatively few copies in circulation, and today, that translates to a triple-digit asking price. That's honestly the most common reason a normal game becomes rare and appreciates in value. Africa is a game sought out only by hardcore collectors, but this happens with games that develop larger followings later on, too. Hell, you can see this with lower-priced games like Driver San Francisco. But occasionally, something strange happens, something that genuinely affects how many copies of a game are available. Remember last year when that whole Cooking Mama fiasco happened? It was pulled from sale right at release, and everyone was rushing to buy it before it became impossible to obtain. Of course, it ended up returning to market in short order, but there was a very real precedent to what those collectors were expecting. EA Sports, it's in the game. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time- oh, oh, oh wait, wrong channel. I have never reviewed a basketball game before, but I have played a fair few of them, albeit not recently. While this may not be my usual area of expertise, the story behind NBA Elite 11 is interesting enough that I want to tell it here on the channel. During the sixth generation, NBA Live was EA's answer to Sega's NBA 2K franchise. The two franchises were pretty comparable at the time, but that all changed when the 360 and PS3 rolled around. From the very beginning of the HD era, there was a huge deficit in review scores between NBA Live and NBA 2K. 
with the latter almost always scoring 15-20% to better on average. After a good 5 years of being beaten to a pulp by 2k at retail, EA finally decided that enough was enough, and that NBA Live would be no more. For the 2011 NBA season, EA was to reboot their basketball gaming efforts with NBA Elite 11, due for release in fall of 2010. And then it was delayed to the holiday season. And then it was cancelled outright. But not before copies were shipped to stores, and while EA did issue the recall order before the game's final release date, a few copies did slip out into the wild, held onto by store employees, leaked by developers, or simply sold before their street date. The copies that did return to EA were subsequently destroyed. The few copies in the wild circulated on auction sites, occasionally popping up for sale at a higher price than the last listing, with the last confirmed public sale having taken place in 2015, when a complete but open copy of the game sold for just short of $900. Here's the thing, though. Pricing NBA Elite 11 today is damn near impossible. Copies have gone up for sale, with asking prices as high as $10,000, but none have sold since that $900 copy back in 2015. Complicating matters further, loose copies have sold for more than that three years earlier, and a graded copy fetched over two grand. The most recent copies to surface did so just three months ago. Someone in the game collecting subreddit posted two discs sourced from EA employees, including possibly the only surviving Xbox 360 copy of the game. If we add this to what Wikipedia claims is the confirmed number of PS3 copies in circulation, which was 9, that makes 11 total copies of the game that are proven to exist. Let that sink in. 11 surviving copies of a AAA game that had a multi-million dollar budget and a license to every team in the NBA. This has to be one of the rarest items in gaming. I say one of, because there was also a series of special NBA Elite 11 PlayStation 3 consoles. There were a few of these in completely unique color schemes gifted to NBA players and entertainers. Two are known to still exist. One is finished in green and adorned with Swarovski crystals, with a matching wooden carrying case. Given the color scheme, this console was likely gifted to the Boston Celtics or maybe the Milwaukee Bucks. There's a red one too, but less is known about that one's history, and there's enough red in the NBA that I can't guess which team it belonged to. Surely, the value of this game has gone up with time as known copies have disappeared into private collections. Demand has only grown as more have learned of the legend. You can bet that if and when another copy comes to market, every collector with the means to do so will be dashing to grab it before it disappears back into the ether. $10,000 might be a bit optimistic, but I wouldn't be surprised if it fetched about half that. Of course, I'm speculating, but that's all we can really do with such a literal unknown quantity. Or is it? Back in 2010, if you asked EA about NBA Elite 11, they'd tell you it was going to completely revolutionize the way basketball games are played. The days of using face buttons to effortlessly execute precise plays were over. EA Canada's vision for the future of the genre was one that instead relied on the right analog stick, for inputs that closer resembled the motion they triggered, while also raising the skill ceiling, allowing serious players to shine. From an outside perspective, I understand exactly where these ideas were coming from. By 2010, EA's Skate franchise had thrice proven that the right stick could replace face buttons in a sports game and meet both of those goals. But having played NBA Elite 11 firsthand, that is... that's just not what happened here. When Elite 11 was cancelled, an EA spokesperson, well, spoke to multiple gaming news sites and told them that while they did feel that the controls were a massive step forward for the genre, the other stuff just wasn't up to snuff. The company feared fans wouldn't be happy with the overall package, and claimed that the controls weren't enough to stop the game from being bad. Journalists praised this out-of-character show of honesty on EA's part, and that's a sentiment I can echo. This is a developer whose policy before and since has largely been, release first, apologize later, and for that same company to cancel a game on which they'd already spent millions developing, manufacturing, and even shipping to retailers, that's unprecedented. <laughs> However, this dude is giving the dev team entirely too much credit because this new control scheme fucking sucks. And I feel like he probably wouldn't have said this if he knew the game would make it into the wild and eventually be uploaded online for anyone with a modern PS3 to experience firsthand. On first inspection, the controls are fine. In the tutorials and front-end shoot-around, keeping track of the mechanics as they're introduced isn't half bad. The controls for layups and such makes perfect sense and seems to follow that same skate philosophy of replicating the actual motion the action would demand in real life. However, the cracks in the game are already showing. There's a reproducible bug that makes any character do... uh... this. Animations in general are a bit shoddy, and that's actually kind of a theme with the NBA Live franchise, even in the newer games. 
Like I said, the controls are decent enough in the main menu, but things fall apart very quickly when we load into an actual game. The offense controls are fine, I guess, they work. The real weak point here is the defense controls, which were just not smartly laid out. All of your defense controls are on the right stick. All of them, including stealing and blocking. So while left and right are your typical reach out to the side to block passing, if you so much as toe the line between left and up, you will jump and completely open up. This is particularly a problem when switching from guarding left to guarding right, or vice versa. You have to move precisely straight across or you're gonna block for no fucking reason. Something like a reach in or a jump block are things that shouldn't be possible to do on accident. They should be face buttons. Let's compare this to how defending works in 2K. Reaching in and blocking are both face buttons as they should be, so you never do them on accident. I know I'm comparing newer 2K games, partially because I don't really own any older ones, but by comparison, Elite 11 just feels completely unnatural. The controls make sense in a 2D plane, but when your characters face different directions and spin around, it's hard to remember that you have to pull down towards yourself to reach into the left of the screen, for example. To make matters worse, there's no indicator as to who you should be guarding with each given player, so if you switch players and go to guard the ball, you might be leaving your man uncovered because the game didn't tell you who you were matched up with. The AI doesn't automatically reassign matchups based on the player's action like it does in 2K, and quick switching between players really seems to have no rhyme or reason as to who you end up controlling. It's worth noting this wasn't a problem in the previous NBA Live game, they specifically removed it for Elite 11, and I have no idea why. Similarly frustrating is passing the ball on offense. To pass, you point the left stick and press R2, but the direction you point the stick seems to have little correlation with where the ball goes. In this clip, for example, I wanted to hand the ball off to the teammate directly next to me, and so I pointed the stick to the bottom left quadrant, but for whatever reason, this resulted in me yeeting the ball across the court and into a turnover. Shooting is likewise sloppy, and the longer I played with these controls, the less confident I became. It got to the point where I wasn't convinced that pointing up on the stick would reliably result in a jump shot, meaning that the rare time it did work, I was often slapped with a traveling call for holding the stick too long. Like I said, the controls are fine in shoot around when it's just you or one or two other characters, but when you combine all of the game's different systems and try to stay on top of your right stick controls while also, you know, playing basketball, it gets to be way too much to wrap the mind around easily. What the fuck, dude? Now, I know what you're thinking. Proficiency comes with time. And sure, I'll buy that. I'm sure more seasoned players would have less trouble with NBA Elite 11, especially if they were more familiar with basketball games than I am. But it's worth noting that 2K has made efforts to be accessible for the casual pick-up-and-play crowd, and that's clearly paid off for them in the long run. And while I am not exactly a basketball game connoisseur, I've put a fair number of hours into more recent 2K games, specifically 2K18 on Switch. But I'm not that into basketball, nor basketball games, and you can assume I'm playing with a relatively low level of skill. But I think I'm more than qualified to say that this game's controls just don't work. Certainly not as well as they needed to be in order for Elite 11 to be the revolutionary next step EA expected it to be. See, I don't think this style of stick control is a bad idea in itself. I actually use a similar setup when I play 2K, but completely abandoning every button on the controller except for R2 was not the move. There are just way too many functions being slapped onto two analog sticks and a single button. Even the pro stick setup in 2K still uses face buttons for the more drastic movements. Especially ones that can result in fouls. <sighs> Outside of the controls, this is basically just NBA Live 10 with a new coat of paint. There's really nothing else different about this. I even ran into the same bug in both games during the making of this video, where the game audio refused to show up in my recording software even though it worked in other games on the same system. And what that tells me is that this is still the NBA Live 10 engine. The only real difference, other than the roster, is that NBA Live is actually a fun, controllable game. But with all that said, I don't understand why EA cancelled NBA Elite 11. Is it a worse game than the previous ones? Well, yeah, but that's never stopped a sports game publisher before, not even EA. I don't think Mr. EA Sports was being honest with us. Granted, people did hate the free demo that dropped a couple weeks before release, Shoot the fucking ball, man, shit! But canceling a finished game that was already manufactured and shipped to retailers over quality issues is such a wildly out of character thing for EA to do, and they have certainly shipped more broken, worse quality games than this. Annual sports games exist expressly because it's easy to just paste new rosters into last year's game and spruce up the branding. It is at this point expected that change will be gradual, and this is true from FIFA to Formula One. There's no way in hell EA would just throw all of that money away out of the goodness of their hearts. There had to have been something really serious going on behind the scenes. 
maybe a legal issue, a game-breaking bug, or security flaw. Many of the surviving disc copies are of the same batch as the one that was sent to Sony for verification to ensure it didn't break the PS3. So maybe it had something to do with that. I don't know what it is, but whatever happened, it was severe enough to mean that not only did Elite 11 get cancelled, but they pulled the plug on NBA Elite 12 and 13 in similar, albeit much earlier, fashions, with the news breaking months instead of days away from release. NBA Live wouldn't resurface until 2013, when NBA Live 14 launched alongside the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. After three years off the market, surely EA came back with a strong show- oh, oh Christ. And would you look at that, NBA Live 14 completely backs down on those stick-driven controls EA was so proud of. It's taken years for NBA Live to finally claw its way back up to even remotely acceptable review scores, but it seems history is repeating itself, as EA has once again cancelled multiple entries in the franchise after their announcement, citing a desire to focus on the next generation of consoles. Gap years aren't unheard of, but this isn't normal. Something is clearly very wrong behind the scenes at EA Sports. Repeated mistakes of this magnitude just don't happen otherwise. Not from a AAA developer. There's definitely room for competition in the NBA video game market, but in honesty, I'm not sure the EA will ever be equipped to take over as the industry leader again. The tale of NBA Live and NBA Elite is a tumultuous, confusing one. And honestly, it verges on depressing at times. I can't even imagine what it's like to spend months or years working on a video game to have it canned at the last moment, or just when you thought you were done. But on the bright side, time heals all wounds. And while I'm sure someone on the team is still cross about it to this day, NBA Elite 11 remains one of the most interesting footnotes in EA Sports history. And while few have played it, its vaporware status ironically means that more people talk about it today than they would be if it came out as planned. In a way, EA made a game so unremarkable that it looped back around to being interesting again. And that kind of story will always fascinate me. EA Sports. It's up your ass. What's the best Need for Speed game for newcomers to the series? That depends on the person. Most Wanted is likely the overall best, Hot Pursuit 2010 is the best for supercar fans, and Heat is likely the most accessible to the average person, since it's a contemporary open world game available on current generation systems. Have you played Initial D Arcade Stage? Yes. An arcade not far from me has a pair each of Stage 3 and Stage 8 Infinity. I also have the PS2 and PS3 games, and I'll likely make a video about them at some point. But in short, fun games, and I wish they port the newer ones to consoles. What is one game you'll never review? I've started writing about my love for Max Payne 3 multiple times, but decided that everything I could reasonably say about it has been said by other creators years ago. So probably that, for no reason other than I don't think I have anything to add to the discussion around it. But for something more in line with what you were probably expecting me to say, I don't think I'll ever make another video about a Forza Motorsport game. Horizon, maybe. But to me, the motorsport games are like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Always expanding, never really changing. I said everything I have to say about this series in my Motorsport 4 video. And any future videos on the topic would likely be a mixture of repeating myself and listing the ways that any given entry is inferior to the fourth. Would you be interested in reviewing Burnout games? There's a reason I haven't. I've said this a couple times before, but my interest in racing games is largely born from my interest in cars. I tend to lean towards the more realistic side of the genre anyways, but even when I'm playing arcade racers, I still prefer real cars. Now Crazy Taxi, that I can do. What's worse, an Alpha Tauri or an Alpha Tauri in the wet? An Alpha Tauri in the wet in any proximity to Hudson. <laughs>